about uh, about the prospects of the future. And you know, of course, there's a certain amount of anarchism amongst young people. Um, you know, and we are. You know, you can probably tell from the from the tenor of our of my questions. Um, you know, really interested in in raising questions of you know whether uh, you know, you know whether in fact there is any prospect of of reconstituting a Marxian left. Well, I could certainly tell you weren't an anarchist. What's that? I could certainly tell you weren't an anarchist. Uh huh. You know, I. It's, I mean, I like like a number of people. You know, I I've basically been politicized by by books. Um, you know, they're they're in in you know I I was in I was really in my twenties in the nineteen nineties, um, and you know there was it was such a you know utterly depoliticized time that um, you know I I didn't I didn't really come to leftist politics through activism. I mean, I was active as a very young man uh, in anti-apartheid campaigns and the like. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's questions as to the, you know, to the real viability of our current politics in terms of, of, of delivering, uh, you know, a more free and, 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 and livable future that, that has driven me to the left. So that that's, you know, that's that's where I'm coming from. Okie dokie. And was that all in Chicago? Just out of curiosity. Um. Well, no. Just my graduate studies have been in Chicago. I'm actually from the South. Uh, I'm a, a hillbilly, I suppose. I from East Tennessee. And I went to college in Virginia at the University of Virginia in the mid-90s, in the early 90s. Are, are you still politically active? Yeah, yes I am. Yeah, in in organized labor or? Uh, no, I, I work with a project called War Times. Uh, it's an anti-war project that was formed right after 9-11. Uh, hmm. Check it out on the web if you want. Uh, I think there's a link to it on that book-related website that I have, uh, which you've probably looked at. I guess that's how you or your friend first found me. So, um, well, I've, I've had your book since it came out. Um, you know, I loved, uh, I, I was, I mean, I'm amazed that, that Verso published it, but, uh, it's, you know, it really is, as I say, I mean, it, I feel like it has, you know, it's, it's the only book that that kind of goes beyond, you know, kind of heroization of the nineteen sixties, uh, into in, into the the turn towards Marxism, uh, that that's that people I think are largely either embarrassed about or or um, you know just would prefer to to forget. Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, yeah, that's. A lot of people want to forget that. That's correct. Okay. Well, should we should we go ahead and 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 launch into it? Sure. Sure. It's your show. Anytime. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, just to start off in 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 the, in the broadest possible way, uh, to to give our our listeners some idea of of the subject matter of revolution in the air. Um, you know, I'd like you just in in brief to to describe, you know, what was the new communist movement, uh, how and when did it emerge, and in brief, uh, what sort of politics did it espouse, uh, who were its leading figures, and 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 what were their motivations, and 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 where, you know, where did it end up? What sort of legacies do you see it having today? The 1960s uh, were a tumultuous time, and during the late 1960s, there was a broad and large radicalization in many sectors of the society, uh, responding to mainly the crises over race and racism and the Vietnam War, uh, 
particularly after 1968, when Martin Luther King was killed, when Johnson was forced to withdraw from the presidency, but the war ground on, and when uh, the, the ghetto rebellions, the uprisings in the late 60s, and it seemed that even after many years of the civil rights movement and it's okay don't worry about it technical I, difficulties i really don't i really hope that this uh doesn't recur um let's just uh let, let's just get right back to it so the last thing i heard you saying is you know you you were talking about the the events of 1968 uh the assassination of martin luther king the uh you know johnson's decision to 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 not run again in in that year etc Okay, the war was grinding on. Uh, there were still major structural problems of racial discrimination, uh, even after 10, 15 years of civil rights agitation. Uh, it seemed that the system was impervious to change. There was a broad and wide radicalization, especially among young people. It was also a time when uh, what's today called the Global South, and the terminology more popular was the Third World, was alive with national liberation movements, most of which identified with some form of Marxism or Marxism-Leninism. You had the Cuban Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, uh, Vietnam, Southern Africa, the Middle East. So there seemed to be a moment when uh, change was in the air. Uh, revolution seemed like a possibility to large numbers of people. People were looking around for some kind of, the young people who were radicalized, looking around for some kind of framework uh, those of us who made the turn and decided we wanted to devote our lives to political activity. Mm -hmm. um, in that mix, uh, for various reasons, uh, mainstream communism identified with the Soviet Union, Trotskyism, uh, they had their adherents, and many young people uh, embraced those political trends, but not the majority. The majority of people who turned toward uh, revolutionary politics uh, looked toward those third world national liberation movements and embraced various versions of Marxism-Leninism influenced by what they thought or what we thought were the uh, perspectives and lessons of those third world revolutions. And within that grouping, a uh, significant number decided that building some kind of new Leninist party that would recapture the revolutionary sentiment and approach that people felt had been lost by the Communist Party and other groups descended from the old left. Uh, so the new communist movement was that an attempt to build a new communist movement and new communist party based on revolutionary ideas that would uh, be strongly internationalist, anti-racist, sink roots within the U.S. working class, take advantage of the huge spontaneous motion that was uh, toward the left within the late 1960s, early 70s. So from 1968 through the early 70s, you saw large numbers of young people, some of whom had been uh, in the various uh, liberation movements, the freedom movements, uh, former members of the Black Panther Party, SNCC, people who had been in black student unions and so on, mm -hmm. uh, white students from SDS, uh, Puerto Rican contingent out of the Young Lords Party and other groups in the Puerto Rican movement, the Chicano movement, the Asian American movement, uh, loosely gathering into a common political trend called, an, called itself the New Communist Movement or the Anti-Revisionist Movement, by which was meant that the official Communist Party had surrendered, supposedly, the revolutionary perspectives into something, a revision of Marxism-Leninism into a non-revolutionary direction. So this new movement would be anti-revisionist um, and would sink roots in the working class and, you know, go on from there. And this, mov and, this movement had roots in the, in, in the student radicalism of the 1960s, but wasn't only coming out of the SDS. That's what I hear you saying. That's right. So, That's so, right. I mean, the component parts, uh, probably the largest single component, just in terms of numbers, came out of the uh, SDS. But uh, its constituent threads came out of uh, Asian-American collectives like Iwar Kuhn in uh, California, uh, 
members of the Young Lords Party, uh, a, a major component force uh, came out of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit, uh, and the various factions of that as the 70s uh, came along. Uh, people who had spearheaded uh, youth movements in the Chicano movement, people coming out of La Raza Unida, Casa, uh, people who had been active in, in a whole range of uh, the social movements of the time. And uh, there were a scattering of individuals who had been active in the old left parties, the Communist Party, the Progressive Labor Party, some of the other parties that hooked up with the younger people. I mean, most people we're talking about here between 1968 and 73 are in their early or mid or some in their late 20s, uh, the boomers, mm -hmm. boomer generation. Um, and it was the plurality of the revolutionaries, uh, people who embraced revolutionary politics at the time. Uh, I think uh, my estimate, I mean, these groups did not, it, it never united into one single group. So it, you, you have to make estimates based on large numbers of different collectives and some national organizations but out of its height, it embraced about 10,000 people who identified strongly with its politics and considered themselves cadre trying to build this new communist party. And then it had a broader periphery. Uh, during, you're talking about the years now from 70, 71, maybe through the mid 70s, late 70s. Okay. And within, you know, within the perhaps familiar story of, of SDS, I mean, it's there, it's interesting because these groups were largely coming out of, I mean, the, those who who ultimately fed into the new communist movement were largely coming out of the revolutionary youth movement at that time, and not coming out of those that that adhered to some kind of proletarian line in the in in the SDS. Uh, whether the Spartacist League or Progressive Labor is—is is that correct? The situation in SDS was complicated. Uh, people, uh, the Progressive Labor Party, which was an early uh, split off from the Communist Party that had taken more the Chinese side in the Sino-Soviet split in the late, uh, in the early mid '60s, uh, went into SDS in the mid '60s, and it uh, promoted a, a, a very orthodox version of Marxism-Leninism. But what happened and, and was influential within the SDS and was opposed, as you pointed out, Spencer, by the uh, revolutionary, over time, uh, another faction developed called the Revolutionary Youth Movement Faction. And the uh, Progressive Labor Party began to isolate itself uh, from the mainstream of SDS because it took the position that the Vietnamese, by negotiating with the uh, U.S., had sold out the revolution and had taken a turn against uh, the Black Panther Party, considered them divisive nationalists uh, in important struggles like the San Francisco State struggle, which had been based, among other things, on open admissions and demanded for ethnic studies. The PL did a flip-flop and decided that uh, open admissions for peoples of color was a bad demand. It was a narrow demand. So this alienated uh, a lot of people who had were roughly oriented toward revolutionary politics and Marxism. And the revolutionary youth faction uh, began to, uh, uh, those adherents moved in that direction. And then there was a split, as again, the classic SDS story, there was a split within the revolutionary youth faction with the one faction, the, which became the Weathermen, essentially uh, writing off the U.S. working class and saying that the only role uh, for whites was in support of uh, a small elite white fighting force would be in support of third world revolutions and the black liberation movement at home versus mm -hmm. a much larger number uh, calling itself RIM2 that would... Um, opposed the Progressive Labor Party for being too negative about the potential of revolutionary nationalism and too negative about the Vietnamese and Chinese revolutions, but um, embraced the idea that the U.S. working class uh, in its majority could be one to revolutionary politics. Uh, and so there was a bitter split between the RIM-1 and the RIM-2 um, faction. And so the people who, from the SDS or the the white student component that went into the new communist movement mainly came from that Rim 2 faction. And one of the preoccupations 
of your book, Revolution in the Air, is to is to counter a, a number of strains of historiography that whether verse you know whether it's it's the bad the good sixties versus the bad sixties or it's the 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 democratic youthful versus the aging sectarian, but along a number of kind of dichotomies, really miss uh, this transition out of SDS uh, into into the revolutionary uh, communist movement via RIM two. Is that is that oversimplifying matters? Well, uh, I mean, you no, know, that's essentially correct. I mean, you have. You know, you have a situation where uh, it's where there's a complicated set of things that go on. Uh, it's certainly true that some of the groups in the late 1960s and in the 70s, uh, and I guess we'll get to this in a few minutes, ad adopted some approaches and tactics that weren't as productive. And uh, the 1970s was not a time of progressive victories, the way that some of the gains that were won in the 1960s, uh, you know, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the blows, the end of Jim Crow, and so on. So, of course, the earlier 60s would be looked on more favorably from that angle. Uh, there's also the case that uh, in mainstream U.S. history, uh, Marxism and socialism and communism are viewed outside the pale, uh, whereas certain kinds of individualistic or small group sort of outlaw politics, there's a glamorization of the outlaw, uh, you know, the Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So while certain forces that were radical but kept their distance from Marxism or the idea of organizing workers in some kind of collective long-term uh, action, that can sort of be romanticized as sort of American revolutionaryism or American radicalism and the tradition of sort of the Robin Hood, uh, Butch Cassidy kind of outlaw kind of thing. Uh, once you turn toward Marxism or Marxism-Leninism, uh, that's considered, you know, that's, that's a step over the line uh, that's on American. So there will be an, atten an attention to that, uh, that that breaks down somewhat along those lines. Um, it's also the case that some of the activity of groups like the Weathermen, you know, when you do bombings and things like that, gets a lot of publicity in media uh, when you're organizing unions, when you're organizing rank-and-file caucuses, when you're trying to build community power uh, in particular communities. Uh, it's a little less glamorous. It's a little less newsworthy. So that doesn't get some of the attention of the kind of historiography that uh, is sort of you know goes for the soundbite journalism and so on. So there's a lot of reasons, uh, different reasons why the more Marxist turn and the groups and individuals that turn toward uh, that kind of politics in the 1970s uh, gets a lot less attention. Okay, I want to. I want to, uh, you know, in addition to these, um, you know, sort of historiographical preoccupations or preoccupations with, with memory, um, you know, I want to ask you a bit about uh, your motivations in writing the book as a, as a direct intervention uh, in in the time, um, you know, in Revolution in the Air, you write of the early seventies. Today, it seems almost unimaginable that Marxist-Leninists constituted the most dynamic section of a vibrant anti-capitalist left. In 2001, the entire left barely registers in U.S. politics. I assume that at the time of writing, in 2001, uh, the entire left barely registers in U.S. politics. Advocates of revolutionary politics have only the barest foothold in popular movements, and among them, an anarchists and revolutionary nationalists hold more influence than Leninists. So when you published Revolution in the Air, uh, the, you know, the book may have been received as a challenge to a kind of post-1989 triumphalism on the left, where the defeats of the 20th century were going inadequately recognized and were not being addressed. And you're insisting on a thoroughgoing revisitation of that experience and of indeed the failures of the generation of 1968 uh, in terms of what their own aspirations had been. Uh, do you still see uh, the intervention of the book and that the book makes uh, in the same way today as you did in 2001? 
or has the experience of the last eight, nine years prompted any reconsideration as to how you regard this history and what it can, what it might mean today? I started writing the book in the mid nineties and, uh, my motivation for starting the book, uh, I, I was working at the time on a, after the particular party group I had been in, in the 1970s and eighties disbanded, I was working on a more ecumenical socialist project a magazine called Crossroads that brought together people from a wide variety of socialist traditions. And uh, we began to encounter uh, layers of young people who had been radicalized in the uh, in response largely to the first Gulf War in 1990-1991. And a whole I was in California at the time, and a range of anti-working class, anti-immigrant uh, propositions in on the California the California ballot. And it was striking how little uh, the folks who had come up uh, in 19, from 89 through 95, 96, uh, knew about what had happened after the 1960s. I mean, they, the ones who were moving toward radicalism heard of the Black Panther Party, and there was literature about the Communist Party and so on, but there was not, um, there was not anything about the new communist movement, or about all these people who we just spoke about who would turn toward Marxism and so on, and it seemed to be a blank page, and I thought that there should be uh, some coverage of that history, since after all, it was an important part of the experience of that radical generation. So my, my, my goals initially were to get that blank space filled in and at least provide a basic historiography of what had happened. Um, and uh, I was particularly struck by the fact that, you know, when I had come up in the mid and late 60s, there was such a discontinuity and, in fact, at that time, even hostility between the old left and the new left. And I thought that that generational discontinuity was a real problem for both the old left and the new left, and I didn't uh, like the idea that that would be repeated uh, in some fashion. So in, in some ways, my goals were a little narrower than, than what you said. Of course, you, you, when you're writing a history book like that, you're dealing with the left, you're trying to engage some of the bigger questions. And uh, my perception of the left in the late 90s was that some of the strengths, as well as some of the weaknesses of the tendency, the new communist tendency, were, were not being appreciated. Um, and so I... Um, the goal was to get them on record. Uh, I, my own ideas, I mean, I didn't have and don't have now some uh, particular notion of exactly how we're going to reconstruct the left. So mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I have some ideas, as anybody does who's been around and done this stuff for 45 years, but uh, it's, it's not like I had some very specific thing. Um, and I guess on reflection, I, I think some of the points that were made in the book, I guess I don't think about it fundamentally differently. Obviously, you have eight or nine more years of experience since, since I turned over the, the passage you read was written uh, about three months before 9-11. And uh, the period since 9-11 has been an intense political period. I've been active in the anti-war uh, movement since 9-12. And um, some of my ideas have changed. But I guess I don't look at the book fundamentally differently than I did then. Okay. And what are some of the things that, you know, what are some of the lessons that you felt, you know, you needed to get on record that were being neglected or forgotten? I mean, mainly in terms of, like, the actual organizational experiences. Well, uh, I think that there are there's some on the positive side and some on the negative side about the uh, particular left tendency that I was writing about. Uh, let me start with the negative side. Um, there was a kind of, um, you know, people came up in the heady 1960s. There was a sense that anything was possible if only we worked hard enough and had the correct line. There was a certain kind of fetish of uh, purity uh, ideological purity, there was a certain kind of volunteerism in terms of being able to leap over objective conditions, uh, and these problems affected our 
generation, and I think they I saw glimpses of them uh, in the kind of movement that came up around Seattle in the World Trade Organization protests in 1999. I think there was some of some of that. Uh, I think we were also afflicted by incredibly rigid uh, ideas about uh, about organization and uh, various kinds of sectarian squabbling that was extremely unfortunate. Uh, and I think there was a general underestimation of how much um, serious uh, theoretical and strategic assessment of the society in which we live uh, needed to be done. And there was a kind of American anti-intellectualism uh, that affected the new communist movement, even at the time when it was uh promoting you know uh slogans like you know lenin's without any uh, revolutionary theory you can't have a revolutionary movement so i think those were all problems that had afflicted uh, a very committed and large group of people uh and i thought that they should get on the record because those problems are not unique to one particular moment or one particular time they they have some roots in uh, pretty deep-seated roots, both in U.S. culture and also in the generational experience of w what happens when people, large numbers of people in their late teens or 20s are radicalized. Uh, on the other hand, on the more positive side, I mm -hmm. think the new communist movement, even though I look back at some of the ways we express this theoretically, there was a commitment to inter, uh, internationalism and to building a multiracial movement that, uh, on the basis of a common commitment to struggle against all forms of racist, racist discrimination, that was unusual for the time and produced um, some very strong uh, bonds uh, across socially imposed barriers and was able to produce um, some kinds of political victories, even if on a small scale, that was pretty important. And uh, the, the effort to sink roots in the working class, the effort to uh, try to uh, build long-term organizations, uh, ones that had some staying power, uh, the idea that you'd go through some ebbs and flows, uh, there were some strengths in the kinds of ideas that infused the new communist movement, even if, you know, some of the theoretical um, explications of them at the time, uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree with exactly how they were put. There was a lot of underlying uh, positive stuff there. Um, you know, this was also the era of the, the rise of what today people call the nonprofit industrial complex, you know, the whole organizing on the left, large numbers of people in 501c3s, they had their place. Uh, you have to deal with the social realities that exist, and that's an important form. But uh, it can be, uh, there's nothing, you know, for the left, like an individual membership, voluntary participation organization where people are in it based upon uh, a common goal. Uh, and that model, uh, albeit being adapted to new conditions um, has some strengths to it. Okay. I I want to come back to, to I mean, you've just said a great deal, and I want to come back to that. Uh, but just moving through, you know, some prepared questions to, to get at the, you know, core themes of your book. Um, in, in the late, and I, and I, you know, this is again to kind of get back to, uh, to the issue of the imagination uh, of the of, of the kind of founding period of sixty eight to seventy three uh, of the new of the new communist movement in the late nineteen sixties when activists politicized in the anti Vietnam War protest movements uh, eventually came to discover Marxism many as you point out felt that if their moment was itself not revolutionary, it was at least pre-revolutionary. It was, as you say, a 1905 moment uh, prior to a coming 1917, a dress rehearsal for the revolution that was expected to take place uh, in, the, in, in, in their lifetime. Explain the grounds on which leftists in the 1960s and early 1970s, and I know you touched on this already just a bit, based their assessment of their historical moment and the sort of consequences that this assessment had for how they oriented 
and conducted their politics? Well, I think the picture of the world that people held at the time was that uh, you had uh, the U.S. As, as the most powerful country in the capitalist world, that a whole section of the world had broken off from the capitalist system, uh, the Soviet bloc, China, and so on. And whether people thought those were socialist or counter system or what have you, there was, of course, you know, many political and theoretical debates. People had all different opinions. But the idea that they were outside the capitalist orbit and would not come back was, and were in some ways a counterweight to capitalist power, that was, that was extremely strong among all, almost all radical tendencies. Then you had the third world, which was, uh, you know, in the period, in retrospect, in the later stages of the world decolonization. But since the leading forces in many of those movements aspired to socialism and saw themselves linking up with that, those sections of the world that had broken off from capitalism, uh, you, you saw that kind of uh, picture in the third world. And then within the capitalist hardlands, uh, the experience, particularly in France in May 1968, when there was uh, unexpectedly, within the matter of a few months, there seemed to be a, a revolutionary situation. And in fact, uh, de Gaulle was almost toppled. Uh, uh, it was very heady times. So you had this picture of big chunks of the world already non-capitalist, whole other chunks of the world uh, moving away from capitalism, and uh, resurgent movements within, uh, within the capitalist world that were beginning to, largely young people and students, but were beginning to make ties, as in France or in Italy in 1969 with hot autumn, uh, the working class was stirring. So there seemed to be the components of, you know, at the, in the framework of the time, the world revolutionary process, uh, a role for the non-capitalist countries, the third world, and revolutionary movements in the advanced capitalist countries. Uh, that was a certain world picture, uh, the idea that profits within the imperialist heartlands were going to be squeezed, there would have to be more attacks on the working class, uh, and this would lead to further radicalization. Um, there's also a certain intangible uh, ideological quality, if you will. Uh, you know, people who were 22, 23 in the late 60s, I mean, uh, people like me were old enough to remember those Southern governors standing at the uh, standing at the universities uh, or in the front of the state house saying segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And then a few years later, Jim Crow is outlawed, uh, legally anyway, in terms of the change in the laws. And you have the huge freedom movement, and you felt you were part of that. You identified with the people who did the freedom rides and sit in. You knew those people if if, if you weren't one of them yourself. So the combination of a certain intellectual viewpoint on what the, sh what the map of the world was and uh, a certain um, sense of having lived through a period of incredible change in which ordinary people had uh, come on the stage and made huge difference, uh, combine that with the whole cultural ferment and all that, and uh, revolution seemed extremely plausible. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think most of us thought you know, it was happening tomorrow, and those of us who had some political experience didn't think it was just going to be a straight shot, uh, you know, one linear rise, after, you know, just complete flow all the way to revolution. But uh, it seemed like, uh, like, I think he used, the, the, you know, the 1905, this was our dress rehearsal. Contradictions were going to intensify, and the next move would be bigger, broader, and more to the left than the 1960s were. That was the mindset. I mean, it is, I'm, 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 I'm very sympathetic to, you know, to the idea that, uh, you know, we want to see radical social change in our lifetimes. And, uh, in, in, you know, I'm not at all uh, interested in, 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 in attempting to dismiss that. It's, it's more a matter of, of thinking you know, how to learn from the generational experience and in a sense how to learn from the way, you know, I mean, would you say that in a sense the the 60s, had, that, the, that the 1970s and the new communist movement uh, were really uh, coming too late uh, or or that, um, that that mistakes were made uh, that that might have been able to to generate, as you say, a more 
uh, flexible, grassroots uh, based and intellectually alive in it for the long haul revolutionary current more than more than one that you know we see to see having survived till today. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess I'm, you know, I'm just asking you to to reflect in the broadest possible sense about, you know, the the desirability that that uh, that that radicals, um, you know, attempt to to seize the potential of capitalist society for uh, for radical transformation, uh, and at the same time uh, have to embed that in 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 a in a kind of strategic approach that can that can actually bring that about and can can foresee the sort of uh, obstacles that are likely to be faced and constraints. Well, yes. I mean, I mean, the spirit of the book is that the revolutionary project is legitimate, uh, positive, uh, desirable, uh, uh, reaffirmed, if you will. Mm-hmm. But that, uh, in, in some sense, it's a long uh, critique, self-critique about what mistakes we made along the way. Uh, I, I, I don't think that even if the generation of 68 had made no mistakes, that we could have accomplished a revolution. Uh, but I do think that the 70s would have been different. The 80s would have been different. History, you know, you ch- could have changed things had we not made uh, some of the mistakes and, and, and did things that were not, <laughs> that were counterproductive. Now, you know, there's a long, you know, debate, discussion about what mistakes were avoidable, what mistakes were unavoidable. I mean, you, you can't do anything without making some mistakes. So, how, you know, how much those mistakes could have been avoided, exactly which ones, you know, what's on the level of individuals, what's on the level of social currents, you know, that can be a philosophical question. But certainly, uh, we took some wrong turns. And uh, exploring what were the, sorting through what were the impulses and directions that we did that moved things forward and where we went wrong, uh, that, that's, you know, the book attempts to, uh, within the context of, first of all, just laying out the facts, which most people are unaware of this history at all. Uh, yeah, I have my ideas about that, and I try to, in the book's final chapters, talk about some of that. For example, um, the goal of revolution, fine, uh, but one does have to decide, is one entering a offensive period or a defensive period? Uh, are you going into a period that's likely to produce advances and gains, or are you going into a period that might consolidate gains already made and try to stave off a counterattack? I mean, you never know for sure. There's no crystal balls. But you have to make, but you abandon all materialism if you don't make some estimate of the forces that are on your side, the forces going against you. What are the tendencies? What's likely? And what do you work with then? How to maximize what's, I mean, that's sort of the tradition of Marxism, of you know, figuring out sort of what's on the agenda, and then within the constraints of objective circumstances, what can you do? And we misassessed those circumstances. We misassessed the balance of forces. We overestimated the strength of the forces that were opposed to capitalism worldwide, and we underestimated capitalism's, U.S. capitalism's counterattack. Uh, we took a whole bunch of things for granted, uh, that, uh, you know, that the gains of the welfare state, for example, were here to stay and that there was no significant tendency in, that could become dominant uh, the way neoliberalism uh, became dominant that would assault that. And uh, we misassessed some of the forces that were arrayed behind that. Uh, had we assessed that better, we might have adjusted our strategies and tactics and organizational approaches to better counter that and weaken the counteroffensive and strength, keep our side a little stronger. So mm-hmm. I don't think a revolution was going to happen in the 70s or the 80s, but we certainly could have entered the 80s, 90s, the period in a stronger position than we are now uh, had the generation of 1968, those of us, uh, not just the new communist movement, but all of us had turned to left of center and radical and revolutionary thinking, um, done it better. Uh, you know, this is really all the questions that I have um, going forward. Turn on this, and and in a sense, they I, I think that you know they're they're broadly about you know how 
we orient towards the future by grasping and criticizing the past. Uh, and in particular, how that was done, uh, you know, by the new communist movement. And so I want to I want to start uh, by by turning to the to the question of of third world Marxism, uh, with with which you you know that you that I think you really lay out in in considerable detail uh, in the opening chapters. Um, in those chapters, you speak of the debates within the new communist movement, or in the, or or, or in the kind of proto organizations that would, that were formed after the late '60s, respecting the relative merits of the Chinese, the Cuban, and the Vietnamese parties. What pitfalls arose from attempting to think proletarian politics on the basis of examples from largely agrarian societies such as these? What sense was developed within the new communist movement of the potentials concentrated in an advanced capitalist country such as the United States, which could not be grasped by looking to politics developed in much more adverse political conditions? Similarly, if, as you observe, the individuals who immersed themselves in the effort to revivify Marxism in the United States were mostly in their 20s, and they could fairly readily live without having to devote the majority of their time, as, as do so many people in their 20s today, uh, to work, and in many cases possess considerable education and privileged access to the legacy of Marxist intellectualism, to say nothing of a wider cultural inheritance by virtue of their education. To what extent was this viewed as an opportunity by budding young radicals in the new communist movement? I guess I'm getting back to the issue of, of anti-intellectualism that, that, that you spoke of before. To what extent was the necessity of expressing solidarity with the left by actually criticizing movements in the third world from a position of solidarity felt to be a necessity amongst this generation? of intellectuals? To what extent was engagement with Marxist theory uh, felt to be a necessary component of appealing to the American working class? And just to wind up the question, to what extent was this felt to be necessary for developing critical solidarity with the revolutionary movements by those incapable on their own of harnessing the full revolutionary potential of the 20th century? And what I mean by that is um, you know, to what extent is actually was the project of actually developing intellectual and theoretical leadership in the first world, where that so much potential is concentrated in terms of education and and theoretical development? How much was that actually thought as, so to speak, an obligation or a responsibility uh, by young uh, by young people in the new communist movement? Well, that, that there's a number of questions there. Um, so let me tackle a few of them. Sure. Um, no, I don't think anyone in the new communist movement uh, thought that we could duplicate the uh, revolutionary processes or approaches of Cuba, China, Vietnam. I mean, everyone understood that these those were uh, third world societies with huge proportions of peasantry, and the U.S. was a majority working class society, advanced industrial society. So on, on, on that level, I don't think people, I don't think within the new communist movement anyway, there might have been some groups on the fringes that literally tried to duplicate that, uh, you know, sort of just simply import those models. There was, though, uh, particularly in a period where uh, Things seemed to have become very, uh, violence was in the air, uh, there was a, the confrontation was very intense, people had been, you know, the, pan, the repression against the Panthers, the level of uh, conflict in the streets. There were some patterns taken from those revolutionary experiences that were unfortunate in terms of bringing them into the uh, politics here. So I think there was an underappreciation of the complexities and importance of dealing with the electoral arena. Uh, what do you do in a society with in very complex structures within the working class and far from a homogeneous working class, not only along racial grounds, because uh, everyone in the new communist movement understood uh, the sociological divisions and discriminations based on race and, uh, and nationality, but all the other ways geographically and culturally 
the society had been. I think there was uh, it wasn't until later that some of Gramsci's ideas become popular. So that there was a, a, a I think uh, we didn't sufficiently grasp uh, the the complexities of dealing with uh, uh, radical politics in an advanced bourgeois democracy uh, such as the United States. And some of that was certainly because uh, we looked mostly uh, to groups in the third world as our um, as our uh, inspiration. Uh, I mean, there was uh, interchange and study back and forth with people in Italy and Portugal and 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 and, and Western Europe and Japan, but uh, probably not as much as there should have been. Um, I think it's also the case that uh, there was a general ideological notion that the received theory of Marxism-Leninism was sufficient theoretically. And while it had to be applied to the concrete conditions in the United States, that sort of the big theoretical questions had been solved. And uh, I don't agree with that anymore. And uh, I'm not... I'm not sure everyone completely agreed with it at the time, but it was pretty dominant. Uh, you know, a sort of re- even the anti-revisionism um, phrase indicates, you know, a sort of going back to orthodoxy as opposed to um, breaking new ground. So I think some of those things were unfortunate on the part about uh, what did it mean that revolutionaries in the U.S. Uh, there was in that period took so much uh, inspiration from uh, the revolutions in the third world. Um, There was, of course, a positive side. I mean, uh, you know, this was a period, it's a little different today, although not completely, uh, the idea that people in the United States, particularly white people, might have something to learn from societies and people of color in, in the third world I mean that that's an important notion. Uh that's a, an important notion for human equality and democracy. Uh doesn't mean you uh you know follow and adapt uncritically, but it certainly means that you might learn something as well as teach. Uh so I think that uh, there was a positive side to that. Uh certainly in the in the early period, I mean that was also true of the relationship of the whole society to the civil rights movement. I mean, you know, when Martin Luther King spoke out against the Vietnam War, one of the main attacks on him was what right did he have to talk about foreign policy? I mean, the basic notion was if you're black, you had no right to say anything about U.S. foreign policy. Hmm. Uh, and that had to get broken down. Uh, that's a basic, uh, you know, that for that idea to be dominant in this society, you're not going to have... Uh, you know, if, if Marx talks about in the manifesto that, 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 that you have to win the battle for democracy, uh, you have to break that idea down. And the idea that ordinary people, black people, have a right to say something about U.S. foreign policy, uh, you know, that's important. And I think there was a positive side to the new communist movement and other radical tendencies uh, embracing that. Um, I mean, on the question of... Oh, I'm if, on the question of critical ahead. solidarity, uh, you know, uh, there was no shortage of criticism of parties around the world that one disagreed with. Uh, those who were orthodox Maoists in the new communist movement pilloried the Cubans. Uh, those who were uh, critical of China's foreign policy in the mid-70s pilloried the Chinese. Uh, so there wasn't... Uh, there wasn't uh, some inherent notion that all these people in the third world can do no wrong and we just have to follow them. Uh, different people, different tendencies within the new communist movement uh, tended to, a- as much out of sectarianism as anything else, sort of embrace one or another ideological lodestar and then do battle with the other ones. Uh, that, was, that was a common problem. Uh, and has been a problem in the left, uh, in the Marxist left, and in the left generally for a long time. Uh, and how one uh, sorting that problem out from the idea of how did one um, develop a uh, what you call critical solidarity uh, along, you know, in the complexities of U.S. domination of the third world and 
how much people know about what's going on. That, that, that's complicated. I do think it's a real challenge, and the communist movement didn't particularly do great at that, but I'm not sure it did that much worse than, than other left tendencies. I don't know whether that standard, <laughs> it's, that's not a good enough standard to, um, to reconstruct a left, but uh, in terms of what happened... Um, uh-huh. There were other dimensions to your question as well. The, the thing about how much uh, did people feel it was a responsibility. Um, with the proviso, a responsibility to uh, develop, take advantage of the privilege to really engage with Marxist theory and move it forward. Uh, again, within the constraints of a certain kind of backward-looking quest for orthodoxy in general, there was, it was uh, people, yes and no. Uh, and that broke down quite a bit within the... I, it's hard to generalize about the new communist movement in that regard because there, were, there was a strong anti-intellectualist strain that came in and that was dominant in some groups. And in others, there was less of that and more of an a exploration of theory. People read capital, capital study groups. Um, so there, that, that's a mixed bag. Okay. Okay. We're going to, you know, the, the, like I say, a lot of the questions in, in some ways push in the same direction. But just coming off of, of what you said just now, I mean, how do you feel about the the question of, I mean, it, it seems to me that there's a whole thicket of, of issues around the, around the question of orthodoxy. Um, in orthodoxy in obviously is it d- doesn't really settle the debate uh, because it it's it's not clear how exactly we inherit the orthodoxy or, or 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 how orthodoxy can be said to have established itself and its credentials um, when we look back historically you know the you know there's the there's the prestige s- surrounding revolutionary success uh, so that you know, in, in, in a sense, that guarantees orthodoxy. But in a, in a sense, that begs the question of, of how, you know, in the revolutionary communist movement, how amongst radicals in the, you know, the, you know that, were, uh, that were attracted in this direction in the late 60s and early 70s, how the entire history uh, that they're inheriting is being assessed. Um, you know, how, how do you feel about the way that, that, that in a sense, orthodoxy was, was constructed? I mean, I don't think that we can, you know, I don't think that we can, that, that we can make, uh, you know, that we can reconstitute the, the Marxist tradition uh, by ourselves. I, I think we, we make a mistake to turn our backs on, on, the, on the history of the left and, and, and so forth. But at the same time, uh, you know, the, there is a question of you know how Stalinism was regarded, how transformations in the Soviet Union were regarded, how the um, you know the social democratic um, you know compromise formations were regarded. I mean, how when you look back at that, do you think there was a kind of certainty around orthodoxy uh, that 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 was disabling? Yes, basically, yes. I think that. Um I use the term about how orthodoxy is constructed, and I think it's difficult to today, uh, until, ni- until the 1980s, there, or at least say from 1917 or the early 20s through the 1980s, there was a world communist movement that had a uh, privileged position on the left, not uh, in the sense that it was the reference point. Uh, it had uh, prestige and power, and uh, for tendencies on the left define themselves largely, not exclusively, but largely in relationship to uh, a certain orthodoxy that had been constructed. There was a genealogy, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and then it breaks in the 70s, do you go with Mao or do you go with the Soviet leadership? But it was a field of force, and it affected every tendency on the left, defining itself in relationship to that construction. And it was extremely difficult for groups and parties. There were a few in countries that had very strong indigenous radical traditions 
and strong communist movements. You know, Italy is probably the biggest exception in the advanced capitalist world, where their identification has a certain roots in Marxism, but also in its elaboration within its uh, home turf. And it was extremely difficult to define yourself outside of taking sides in how that was constructed. And on both the Maoist and the official Soviet side, you know, Stalin was criticized in, to varying degrees in both of those. But the notion was, you know, this, he was part of the lineage and it was, you know, the Chinese, it was 70% good, 30% bad. And in the Khrushchev version, it was uh, different. But, you know, there was this unbroken tradition, and you had to be within it if you were going to be a revolutionary communist. And everyone outside of that tradition, whichever one you were in, if you were Trotskyist, obviously a different iconography, um, you know, everything was absorbed through that. And I do think that that was a real obstacle. Um, since 1989, uh, the collapse of the Soviet bloc, Tiananmen Square, I mean, there are certain, there are certain small groups around the world that still operate with that framework. But basically, that framework's been busted wide open. And that is not how most of the world and most of radicalism looks at things anymore. Uh, now, there are some negative things, as you hint, that come along with that, which is there can be a sort of contempt for history altogether. Well, none of that matters. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all what happened. There's no lessons. It was all, you know, a waste of time. Uh, everything, every one of them wrote, anything that's polemical is bad. You know, so there are some negative things that, that can come along with it. But there's also the opportunity to take the materials conception of history, certain notions of politics and so on that are roughly in the tradition of working class radicalism, Marxism, you know, and to uh, move it forward and try to figure out what it means in the 21st century without immediately having to uh, dismiss ideas if they come from a rival tendency or from, a, God forbid, a bourgeois social scientist, which, of course, m Marxists always try to absorb the best in bourgeois thought. Um, so uh, it's a new situation since 1989. And I don't, I mean, I certainly don't have the answer to how we, I mean, I have some ideas, but... It's a massive reconstruction project uh, in the post-1989 world to figure out uh, what uh, a new uh, revolutionary project or projects will look like. I don't think we're, I think it's highly unlikely that a revived international revolutionary movement will look anything like uh, the map uh, that looked like between 1920s and the late 1980s. No. Let me turn towards the the issue of third world Marxism. I mean, on the one hand, the new communist movement is is making a concerted effort to, as you say, uh, sink roots within the working class. Uh, on the other hand, it does seem to me that um, there were a, there was a kind of tension uh, within third world Marxism respecting that project, and it, it's it's there that I, that this question is directed. Uh, the third world Marxism that you discuss uh, was preoccupied with American imperialist exploitation, and, and this is a kind of leitmotif uh, amongst new communist movement tendencies, and, and therefore with domination outside of the U.S. Thus, just to take one example, uh, when Bob Avakian and, uh, is his name Stephen Hamilton? Steve Hamilton, yeah. Yeah, Steve Hamilton's uh, Bay Area Revolutionary Union, the kind of early uh, formation within what in, within the, the New Communist Movement, argued in Red Papers 1 in 1969 that the American working class has, quote, a special responsibility to the peoples of the world. It's unclear how, how the politics of anti-imperialism was actually going to be translated into an ongoing project of improving the material conditions of American workers themselves. In other words, there's a there's a way in which the anti-imperialist politics could you know, could take up this notion that somehow American workers are bought off or bribed off, and and and, and it's it's from there that I want to explore some questions. Similarly, in Red Papers too, 
besides national liberation for blacks and Chicanos, anti-imperialism, anti-fascism, feminism, etc., the program was one, as far as the workers were concerned, of, quote, resisting an attack on living standards. Um, so, and then, of course, the Communist Party of China says that it sees little potential in revolutionary movement in the advanced capitalist world and, and as you say, was more interested in strengthening ties with Western governments. So in the absence of a politics that could criticize American affluence and emphasize the need for ongoing achievement, preservation, and further development of real gains for the American working class, it's difficult to imagine how the new communist movement or in any Marxist politics could actually gain traction in the United States. Of course, America, the, the affluence of the American working class may be not as great now as it was then, or, or in some sense it's different now. Uh, so just to quote Theodore Adorno, writing in the 40s, of, in, a, in an earlier crisis of Marxism, he, he said that you know Marxism has to take on directly the question of affluence and to strip the veil from the eyes of the wise guys, by which I think he means the, you know, the, the kind of confirmed, uh, you know, liberal union men, Democratic Party leadership union men, uh, the illusion that capitalism, which makes, its, makes them its temporary beneficiaries, is based on anything other than their exploitation and expression. So to what extent did the, did the new communist movement confront this contradiction, if there is one, between third worldism and the project of gaining the confidence of the working class and of building revolutionary class consciousness? Well, I, I, I think you used the word tension in the beginning, and I think that's a good one. There, there, were, there, were, there was a tension in that, uh, in that project, and uh, it's one that uh, there's a lot of lessons from how the new communist movement approached it or different tendencies within the new communist movement, good and bad. Uh, I mean, the basic standpoint of the new communist movement was the capitalist exploiters who ran the United States were the common enemy of the peoples of the third world and the peoples of the United States. And that defeat of that common enemy meant uh, liberation for both. And that, that we were bound together our, by pro international proletarian solidarity and we shared a common enemy. Uh, and there was, and on the one point of view and, and on one angle, uh, it was our internationalist responsibility to fight against uh, our own ruling class that was waging war in and exploiting peoples of the third world. Uh, and that, at the same time, that was in our own interests, uh, because by freeing peoples of the third world from U.S. domination would weaken our common enemy and would also open up new possibilities for working class struggle here. Uh, it was also in our common interest in more, you know, I don't know, day-to-day -day ways. People wouldn't be sent off to die in imperial wars. People wouldn't have to be paying taxes for bases uh, dominating the rest of the world. People wouldn't have to be living in fear of the nuclear uh, confrontation because uh, you could move toward disarmament. You wouldn't need all these nuclear weapons to protect the empire. So that that, that was the, you know, the, there was a fundamental um that was a sort of principle kind of thing. I, I don't think that's much different from, you know, when Marx writes about the relationship between the English workers and the Irish workers and talks about how the precondition for the liberation of English workers is independence for Ireland, because uh, as long as the Irish workers hate the, the English workers hate the Irish workers and regard them as uh, competing, uh, you, you know, then uh, English workers will not be liberated. So, um, so I think on that basis, I, I guess I think that's pretty sound uh, as far as it goes. Okay. Then uh, where you go with that, uh, there certainly were tendencies then, especially in, a, in, a, in, a, in sets of young radicals who were just uh, impassioned by the brutality of some of these wars in the third world and a certain kind of anger at... Uh, other people in the United States who didn't share that immediate visceral anger, uh, there could be a tendency to get into all this kind of stuff where you are uh, you're not talking about the liberatory potential and what it means for the positive life futures of the majority of the American working class. Again, you get off into a weatherman kind of politics where you know you people are just collaborators with the class enemy and 
you know, fight the people, which at one point was one of the Weatherman slogans. Uh, uh, on the other hand, there were tendencies, you could go tendencies in the other direction where the only thing you would talk about, about what was wrong, say, with the continuing imperial wars was that, uh, you know, uh, American workers were being hurt and being asked to pay for them and fight them, and there wouldn't be any effort to humanize and talk about the situation uh, of the other side, uh, so-called other side. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's certainly true that uh, I don't think that the new communist movement paid as much attention as we might have to talking about what a um, what a brighter future for the American working class could be there was a lot more emphasis on critique of what was and different horror stories, all of which, many of which were true about the ways workers were being treated. There wasn't that much uh, of a visionary component about what could uh, progress and socialism in the United States look like in an era of abundance and uh, so on. And there, w- there was probably less of that that might stem in part from sort of the anti-consumerist ideas that were popular in the new left and so on. So there, there were certainly shortcomings and problems in how the new communist movement and other radical tendencies dealt with internationalism. But um, but I don't, and, and, and any individual, you know, I, I mean, who knows what all of the individuals thought at any given moment. But I think the idea that we were in a common enemy, life would be better for American workers, life would be better for Vietnamese workers, Uruguayan workers, Palestinian workers. I don't, I don't think that people didn't think that in a sort of basic worldview sense. Uh, turning it into an effective practice, that's something else. And it's uh, certainly true the new communist movement didn't master that. Okay. Well, the, the, just trying to, to to cover everything that I wanted to talk about, and I know you've you've probably got other things to do today. Um, I, you know, and and I just I like I say I I really enjoyed the book. I could talk to you about it all day long. So let me at least make sure that I ask you the main questions that I that I wanted to raise. Um, you know about class. Um, you know, and of course, it's what's really distinctive about uh, the new communist movement, or, or in a sense, the '70s turn more generally, where you saw young people who were politicized in the 1960s, uh, perhaps in their late teens, early 20s, uh, in their 20s, turning away from middle class professions, uh, in in and proletarianizing, uh, in 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 the name of politics. Um, you know, and so just to quote you briefly, you say that the new communist movement worked overtime to present itself and actually become culturally in and of the proletariat. This was no simple task. Faced with a badly divided working class and fuzzy borders between the working class and other classes, it was hard to locate any kind of uniform or clear-cut working class culture. Within people of color communities, there were identifiable cultures of resistance, and a few organizations had some success meshing into and helping sustain them. But there were few left-wing cultural milieus that simultaneously crossed racial lines and had a mass character. And from here you go on to talk about how the desire to become working class manifested itself in attempts to accommodate activists to being to adopting certain styles of dress, uh, even to adopting what you call a crude anti-intellectualism, sometimes cultural conservatism, avoidance of homosexual activity and drug use, uh, and even, as you, as you say at one point, an almost, a near encouragement of, of alcohol use instead. Um, this points, I think, to the question of how the new communist movement came to understand the working class as something uniform or clear-cut or something that had identifiable tastes and practices that rather than necessarily to be intersected and perhaps in some ways criticized and engaged was largely to be accommodated to or even imitated. Uh, How did this conception of class and of class politics develop and how might it be said to have limited the activity and imagination of the new communist movement? Uh, I don't really know all the reasons why that developed. Um, 
and I, I, I think uh, some of those efforts were, uh, you know, you, you mentioned earlier the uh, Vakey and Hamilton. I mean, they moved to Richmond. The, uh, the collective moved to Richmond, supported an oil worker strike, tried to work with the unions, build student worker alliances. I mean, some of this was just a, a certain um, naivete, ignorance. Uh, uh, you know, you're fighting with people about politics. You want to blend in in other ways uh, or blend into what you think people think. Uh, uh, you know, Doonesbury, Doonesbury did a bunch of cartoons about the summer workings. Marvelous Mark, who's now the NPR guy. Uh, you know, goes to work as a as a as a bricklayer, and, 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 and they spoof all of his interactions with workers and his stereotypes. So I think there was a, a certain primitiveness, and um, those kinds of ideas um, were, you know, they uh, I don't know, they're kind of embarrassing in retrospect. Uh, they didn't last all that terribly long, if only because they were so unsuccessful. I mean, anybody who stayed at it for a few years, and many people from the new communist movement did, uh, you know, got better at it and realized that some of those stereotypes were just stereotypes and that um, changed their approaches. And that's how many of them stayed in the labor movement and stayed in working class communities and their life their life trajectories were changed by those decisions and stayed with it. A lot of others, you know, worked for a few years in a factory and then decided it wasn't for them for whatever reasons, went back to graduate school, did something else. Um, so uh, that kind of reification of, of, uh, of workers, um, you know, it was an, you know, it, it was, uh, it didn't work. And uh, it was, uh, came from a lot of inexperienced prejudices, stereotypes, and a certain kind of, you know, some of that orthodoxy thing that I talked about before, a certain image of what had happened in the 1930s and attempt to duplicate it, uh, which was, like you said, it was constructed. It wasn't really what had happened at all in the first place, but it was constructed a certain way. Uh, I think as time went on, those new communist groups that managed to get past an initial stage and acquire enough staying power that they actually had some relationship to at least some group of workers. I mean, you're talking about groups of a few hundred to a thousand or two people uh, in terms of the size of those organizations. Uh, some of those kinds of things uh, got shed. Uh, I don't think any of our groups ever got, I mean, the Communist Party in the 30s grew to 20, 30,000 members, majority, or at least about 50% industrial workers. None of the new communist movement groups ever retained that kind of size or level of roots within the working class. So, of course, their uh, conceptions uh, and, and interactions were more primitive and idiosyncratic factors of different individuals uh, loom larger in small groups than when you actually uh, become a, a mass sociological phenomenon, which the new communist movement groups just sort of on the edge of uh, didn't quite make it over that hump. I mean, none of them eventually, I mean, some still exist, but none of them developed the kind of organic roots in the working class that the Communist Party did in, uh, in the 1930s, and that even survived McCarthyism and lasted into the 60s, 70s, and, and still has some echoes today. I, I want to turn, you know, towards, you know, in a sense, the, the conclusions uh, of the book or the, or the way that the story uh, that you relate plays out. Uh, and in in some ways, you know, the it's interesting that the commitment to anti-racism, uh, in a way, becomes, uh, it, 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 at one level, it's almost a defining, um, it, it's almost a defining common element of, of all of these tendencies. And on the other hand, it becomes extremely divisive amongst them uh, in, in terms of how they it seek to, to, in a sense, actualize an anti-racist politics. And so turning to this, uh, to, 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 to your discussion of the, of the Boston busing crisis, um, 
in the mid 70s and I want you to you know t to kind of explain some of the background to that uh, for our listeners uh, you write that the revolution the failure of the anti-revisionists by which you mean broad uh, you know the, the the broad spectrum of the of the new communist movement uh, to provide effective leadership was an extremely serious blow to the movement up through 1973 the new communist movement's dedication to anti-racism and the strength of its track record in political practice had been one of its strongest attractions but now at the time of the Boston busing crisis the movement was divided over the basic issue um, whether the, whether the fight was one against racism or whether the crisis was really a confrontation with, the, with a ruling class plot to use busing to divide workers. This raises the question of the adequacy of the politics of anti-racism or the complexities, perhaps, uh, you might prefer to say. Judged in retrospect, from the position of a functionally post-racist society whose social barbarism against racial minority um, nevertheless matches or it even exceeds the past. In other, in other words, in some ways, um, in Obama's America, we're both facing a more and less racist society. Uh, that is, at a time when blacks and other racial minorities are simultaneously well, if not proportionally represented in the ruling class, and underpaid and, disp and, under and unemployed, the anti-racist politics of the new communist movement feels misguided or anachronistic, if not destructive. What are the limits, as you see them today, of viewing the racial composition of the American working class in terms of oppressed national minorities and the, all of the difficulties that this led to uh, in the mid-70s? Uh, okay, a lot of questions there, too. Yes. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, race and racism as a defining feature, uh, yes. Uh, you know, in the way that the civil rights movement was, uh, I think, in retrospect, uh, the, the defining feature of the 1960s. I mean, uh, you can't understand the Vietnam War, anti-Vietnam War movement, and the, 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 uh, the origins of the women's movement, the gay movement, uh, the different social movements, the backlash, the new right. Uh, I mean, the civil rights movement from 55 to, you know, through the late 60s, is the driving force of social change and the new communist movement and most other radical trends to varying degrees of self-awareness uh, were fundamentally shaped by the civil rights movement and its links to um, what was going on in the rest of the world at the time. I mean, it's not an accident that the best speech uh, two weeks ago at the One Nation rally in Washington, D.C. is Harry Belafonte, who comes right out of that movement and was instrumental in linking SNCC to Africa and uh, the whole movement around Martin Luther King and uh, all of that. So sure, yeah, that was central and it was central to the political self-identification of people in the new communist movement and other radical tendencies. The Boston busing crisis, uh, what the background to that, uh, <laughs> so, you know, books have been written about this, but uh, you know, segregation uh, meant uh, not just that there was a social stigma to uh, being not allowed to go to schools that were reserved for whites only, uh, which is what was done in the what, the ruling in 54 Brown versus education about separate being inherently unequal, but the driving force of that in black communities across the country also was that there was a two-tier school system, funding, uh, attention, building quality, every single thing that contributes to education was second class in schools that were all black. And uh, it meant that there was a two-tier school system. So the drive for integration was, uh, was really a drive for a, a one-tier school system, desegregation, uh, equal treatment, equal funding, equal facilities, equally qualified teachers, every single other thing that has to do with giving kids uh, equal chance at, at education. It wasn't about, you know, sitting next to white kids. It was involved getting an equal education, mm -hmm. uh, which also certainly had a dimension of fighting the social stigma of, you know, you're not good enough. You're somehow to have to sit at the back of the bus or in a separate school. So there was a long struggle in Boston led by 
different forces in the black community for a decade against the segregated school system and uh, winding through the courts and through mass action, demonstrations, petitions, all, all, the, all kinds of things. And in 70, I forget exactly the year, maybe 72 or 73, one of the judges in Boston finally found uh, the systematic discrimination and ordered uh, the desegregation and via the mechanism of busing. And of course, busing wasn't uh, the best, uh, maybe, uh, you know, exactly how you would do the mechanisms of desegregation uh, in a society where you have such segregation in housing and residential patterns, extremely difficult. So, but uh, it was one after a long haul. And the busing was supposed to start on September, uh, in September, I think, 74. So, I mean, in a sense, I, 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 I appreciate you laying the background. So in a way, the way you talk about it, it, it seems almost, I mean, yes, there's complexity, but at some political, at a fundamental political level, it's, it's strange that there would be a great deal of divisiveness about it. What was it about the, the actual theoretical debates around race and, you know, the debates about the correctness or incorrectness of the CPUSA's line from the 30s, you know, the Black Belt thesis, changing line amongst uh, the RU. I mean, that, that's a kind of history that I feel like, um, you know, gives a flavor of the period and the infighting. And, and, and that's why I wanted, you know, I, 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 I appreciate that, that it is a complicated history, uh, but that if you could just try to thread that through, uh, in terms of how Marxists looked at it. Uh, okay, well, you're right. I mean, there there was a there, there are different dimensions of this, and what I just said about the Boston, the history of the struggle around Boston and busing, um, it, it's a mark of what was and what wasn't relevant in the way the debates in the new communist movement and other sections on the left and its frameworks that came down. Uh, of how it actually looked at any of those events uh, that were actually taking place on the ground. Uh, the, the, the new communist movement uh, embraced, or most of it embraced, uh, a look back at the uh, resolutions from the common that were um, 1928 and 1930 when the Communist Party was trying to grapple with the character of the oppression of African Americans uh, after coming out of a socialist party that tended to have the line that said we will make no special appeals to uh, African Americans, we have nothing special to offer them, and in, in practice it meant there was not a particular struggle against racial discrimination, and the idea was, you know, whatever version of socialism that would come in, all workers would benefit. Um, and the Communist Party was uh, trying to deal with the fact that 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 was not adequate. There was it was a period, you know, awakening again of peoples of color all over the world and national liberation movements, uh, the African American movement, the Garvey movement in the United States, and so there was uh, an effort on the Communist Party's part to deal with the fact that there was a distinct dynamic to the black freedom movement. Uh, it often had a cross-class dynamic against racial discrimination. It was progressive. It was anti, um, uh, it was for equality. It was for democracy. And the particular theoretical frame that was put on that often, you know, from the writings in Eastern Europe was that it was, uh, uh, there was a black nation, uh, that African Americans had constituted were forged into a nation, and it was a national liberation movement uh, within. Uh, and then African Americans in the Black Belt South constituted a nation, and African Americans elsewhere in the society constituted a national minority. And uh, there was a lot of debate in, in in the Communist Party, and there's a lot of historical debate about how much the actual nation aspect. Uh, of that resolution had to do with the Communist Party's relatively advanced practice through the 30s, 40s on, on the issue of racial equality and how much of it had to do with the fact that by giving special attention and talking about the need for uh, the, the working class as a whole to embrace uh, the demands for full equality for African Americans, 
uh, how much of that was the driving force. So you get into the 70s and the new communist movement and different groups had various versions of the black nation thesis or not, but all the groups in the new communist movement had to do, had a, a view that the struggle against racism had its own independent dynamic. It wasn't simply reducible to the issue of class and was an important struggle to be taken up by the working class as a whole. Uh, you get to Boston and the, against the backdrop that I just laid out, and um, the controversy there becomes whether or not the final ruling around using busing to, to, as the vehicle to address the desegregation struggle that's been coming, uh, that's been there in Boston for more than a decade, uh, whether that busing is a plot by the capitalists to divide the working class along racial lines, or whether that uh, the working class is already divided and the resistance to busing is principally a keeps blacks out movement. That resistance took violent form. There were mobs attacking buses with black school children and so on and so forth. Most of the left uh, and most of the new communist movement took the point of view that uh, blacks had the right to go to uh, any school they wanted. This was a desegregation, anti-racist struggle. Uh, it's not the bus, it's us. That's what Jesse Jackson said. He was part of that movement. Pretty much everyone from the NACP and uh, most of the black freedom movement, over most of the new communist movement, the Communist Party, the Trotskyist groups, uh, took the line that it was an anti-racist struggle. Uh, the RU, which was the largest new communist movement group at the time, and a few other groups took the point of view that it was mainly a ruling class plot to divide workers. And so the new communist movement was not united in its opposition to uh, on any one particular point of view. And it was pretty much the first time since the uh, new communist movement's origins in the late 60s that it wasn't united in a practical sense around any particular struggle. There had been all these theoretical debates about the black nation thesis, racial oppression, national oppression, national minority oppression, but it had not translated into a uh, actual um, pra taking different sides in a practical struggle of large significance, which in fact the Boston busing crisis took on national national significance. There were national demonstrations and was a flashpoint in the anti-racist struggle in the 74, 75. So it meant that the new communist movement as a tendency as a whole was uh, didn't provided no common direction that was bitter fights within that. Um, what that had to do with the existence or lack of existence of a black nation or not, I, I, I don't particularly think that that, in fact, uh, was the issue. Uh, it, it's still difficult for me to figure out how that um, exactly fits into that struggle. It more has to do with your view of uh, the relationship between mass struggles and uh, reforms and how the ruling class makes concessions and whether those concessions then become uh, sort of plots to divide and weaken or whether those concessions, they have a dual character. They've been wrung out of the ruling class through mass struggle, but of course they take certain forms because that's what you know the ruling class, when it makes concessions, wants to make it in its way most favorable for them. But uh, but it was a it, it was a uh, a turning point in the new communist movement's capacity to unite and act as a pole of attraction for the broad left as a whole, uh, combined with other struggles a year later over China's foreign policy, uh, left the new communist movement so badly divided it it pretty much lost the kind of force of attraction that it had from sixty eight sixty nine seventy through the mid seventies. Just. What what this says on the last party question about the, mm. the 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 new communist movement strategy? I mean, clearly from the Boston thing, there wasn't just one. Uh, there, there became different approaches from different groups. But the but I, I guess it's it's not so clear to me uh, what what, you, what the question was trying to get at in the second part about um, about. I mean, the demographics of the country are different today. The uh, nature of the anti-racist struggle in some respects has changed. But the idea that 
there needs to be a uh, across the board struggle for full equality uh rooted in a multiracial anti racist movement within which you know the communities of color are going to you know for going to in the be the driving forces by and large um i don't i don't i i guess i don't well i i, I guess what i i mean I, the, I guess what i was trying to get at i mean in the r u which will become the the current r c p that's correct yes right the, they're they're quite active uh here on the university of chicago campus um I mean, they're arriving by a certain logic at, at at an argument about the... I mean, what you're saying is, in a sense, there's a logic about, okay, the Black Belt thesis may have been right then, but it was also right to abandon it because of the demographic transformations uh, in America and the integration of the American working class uh, makes the... You know, you know, changes the nature of the question, how that relates to the... Boston, you know, the, the attempt to implement a judge's decision in Boston in the mid 1970s, uh, and viewing that as a kind of ruling class plot, you're saying that the connection there is opaque. Um, w what I'm trying to say is that in terms of the whole nature of, I mean, I I, I agree on the one hand uh, that you know that there that issues of racism still remain. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the, the way in which these things were argued at one time uh, in terms of, you know, the presence of third world nationalities in the United States or that, that somehow, you know, minorities are, 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 are you know, of, of any other nationality, uh, you know, the, the, the ability, you know, or the desirability of, of minorities to organize separately. Uh, these things to me seem very foreign to the present moment, um, and you know, and, and the the red, you know, the the obvious fact that your boss is likely to be black, or indeed the commander in chief of American imperialism uh, uh, could be black, is is something that people take for granted. And I guess it was that sort of issue that I was trying to raise: is isn't there a way in which, you know, the 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 legacy of the '30s kind of arguing over the black belt thesis in various ways just it doesn't really resonate anymore well i was in in a part of the new communist movement that didn't think it resonated then uh i mean i there's a uh, i mean the, the the particular part of the movement i was in did not think that the black belt nation theory was ever correct Mm -hmm. uh, and we argued a particular point of view having to do with uh, racial categories and race and uh, race relations and racism in the United States. There's a very good article about it in uh, Month Review a few years ago. It's a tribute to Harry Chang by uh, a close comrade of mine, Bob Wing. Uh, there's a whole you know school of thought around this uh, that's evolved in various ways into critical race theory and uh, various other strands of uh, approach to looking at the history of U.S. and race and nationality. So, um, you know, okay. so I, I, I would agree that I don't think that the theoretical, uh, the, using the strictly the theoretical tools of nation and nationality uh, is very useful at analyzing the history of U.S. race relations and the relationship <clears throat> between uh, basically immigrant communities whose home nation is somewhere else and then uh, are, uh, become integrated into the political economy in the U.S., I, don't, I, I agree theoretically. I don't think that, that, that those tools are the most useful ones. Um, I think in the, in the... I will say, though, that even the people... You know, we had some sharp polemics back then in the new communist movement over this and, and, and still uh, some, yeah, some of that debate lingers today. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say even uh, on the folks who I, dis who I disagreed with then, uh, even though I didn't necessarily think that theoretical tools were the right ones, uh, there was a lot of uh, sensible stuff. Uh, and sometimes you read these things, the, the abstract debates uh, you, over those tools tended to be, uh, yeah, they tended to fall into who's truer to 
the you know whatever the constructed orthodoxy is there was a lot of gymnastics around that but usually when it came to analyzing concrete struggles uh the majority of folks were pr- were pretty good and uh, even if they used theoretical frameworks that i disagreed with i think that they had some advanced practice around some of the key struggles of the 70s whether it was the baki case which was a key in popularizing this whole idea of reverse discrimination and so on. Um, how much, but, you know, for, for approaching today's society, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think the idea that there are oppressed nations within the borders of the U.S. helps very much in looking at the actual political economy and social relationships unless you're referring to specific Native American tribes which have treaty relations and it's a different situation. So Okay. okay. That's, That's the last, last question. question. Okay. Um you know I I'm, I'm interested in and this in some ways gets back to, to where we began. Um to the discussion that uh can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um to the discussion that or the the argument that you make that there was a an outright misassessment of how cap how ripe capitalism uh, was for defeat, and this question isn't about so much directly challenging that claim is as to you know how we think about it, um, you know how how we how we think about possibility looking forward versus how we look at the defeat of possibility uh, retrospectively. And, and, I, and so I want to ask, you know, can we really accept that, that defeat uh, is, is necessarily evidence for the unripeness of capitalism uh, for revolution? And doesn't defeat in some ways, or the form that defeat has taken and the kind of... Um, you know, resounding character of the defeat of the left uh, as we find it today, doesn't it in some ways render capitalism less ripe for future revolution? And do we not run the risk in such an assessment of imposing false necessity upon history and treating accomplished fact as inevitable? Uh, I, I, I like a line from the American version of the International that that reads to make the thief disgorge his booty and the and free the f- spirit from his cell. We must ourselves decide our duty. We must decide and do it well. When reflecting on the politics of the 1970s, your your book Revolution in the Air doesn't shrink from a recognition of defeat. But to what extent might we say that the limitations of our past politics are actually responsible for the present? In other words, not only that. In a sense, someone else won, but that we won in ways that we didn't expect to. Uh, That is, it seems to me that even the right today is molded by the experience of the 60s and 70s radical left, not only in the sense that they were forced to make concessions, but that in a sense the radical politics of the past has been stabilized uh, as a new status quo in some sense. And that that's what we mean by the strength of the right, the great difficulty in deciding and doing well. Can we could just leave it there? How how, how for the left doesn't history task us with the unpleasant necessity of of taking responsibility for the present? And 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 to what extent do you feel that the, that that your book does that? And how do you feel about that today? Uh, hmm. Well, I think we're, of course, the present is the total of all the things that have happened, and the left was part of that, and we're we're responsible for our share. And uh, I don't think it would be, uh, you know, we can't let ourselves off the hook and say that the current situation has nothing to do with us, and, you know, the things we did right and wrong, we, you know, have nothing to do with where we are. We certainly can't just give ourselves credit for good things and then let ourselves off the hook for the bad things. So we're part of it. At the same time, I think there has to be a sense of proportion about what part uh, what part we had some control over and what part we didn't. Uh, 
and the same, uh, you, you know, the same, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, this, this some assessment of trying to get a balance between the different social forces, what their potentialities were at every, any given moment, and to what extent they realized it. I, I don't think Marx is responsible for the failure of the 1848 revolutions. Uh, mm-hmm. there, it may be true that some of the things that the Marxists did could have affected the outcome in some way, but uh, fundamentally it was an issue of the balance of forces at the time. Uh, I think that the left worldwide uh, certainly had a, a reasonable amount to do with why the 21st, beginning of the 21st century looks the way it does. Uh, I'm not sure how much the U.S. left in the 70s. I think I tried to say in the book that um, we could have created certain things that would have changed the outcome of political battles between then and now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Exactly how much, I mean, that's an ongoing historical debate. I I don't, you you know, you're... you're, um, I mean, there's a sort of moral, philosophical, and political dimensions to your question, right? And uh, you know, struggling for the right uh, for the right uh, sense of proportion politically. I mean, that's part of uh, you know part of assessing uh, that that's a political judgment. You know, I I, I want to thank you so much for taking your time today, uh, Max. It's it's really. I've I've really loved our conversation and 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 appreciated the thoughtfulness of you know in in the kind of clarity of your replies. Sure. Well, it was a lot of fun. I haven't thought about some of these things in a while. I, my political attention has been on some other aspects of politics, so it's kind of interesting and uh, be interesting to see what you and uh, the folks you work with make of it all. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to stop recording.